Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Rightly or wrongly, as an outsider, I see salmon fishing as an overpriced, under-resourced branch of freshwater fishing, in which the majority of fish caught are taken by a minority of those anglers fishing for them, either because most of the best locations of the key times are blocked book by the well-heeled, who do so simply because they can, or a book by more modestly resourced genuine devotees combining natural ability with years of hard-earned watercraft. With me today is a salmon angler from the latter camp, Bill Briggs, who is an acknowledged specialist on the technique of whitewater upstream worm fishing. Now it has to be said that amongst salmon angling purists, the words salmon and worm don't usually belong in the same sentence. Unless, of course, they're running the technique down. Hopefully then, this interview will help redress that balance. But before we get into the real nitty gritty, perhaps we should first take a brief look at your wider salmon angling credentials by exploring your introduction to salmon fishing, its appeal to you, and how you graduated through the various available options to specialise in fishing the worm. The appeal of salmon fishing, that came about many, many years ago when, after I first got married, I lived in Chorley and then moved into Exton and got very friendly with the licensee of the uh, Talbot Arms. And Alan was a very, very keen salmon and uh, sea trout fly fishing man. And I ended up, I'd always been a course angler up to then, but then started going salmon fishing and actually learned to fly fish in the dark at night on the border esque. So that's basically how I got started. But then later on I joined Kent Anglers um, on the River Kent up in Kendall. And that's how I got involved in worm fishing, through watching the guys fish up there because of the type of river that it is. And... It went on from there and then went away on holiday up Scotland to a, a place that we'd, we'd never been to before and we went to go fishing and got there and found out that it was a white water river and it was worm fishing, which of course was totally different to what we'd ever seen before. Didn't expect it to be worm fishing and of course we'd gone be- without any worms. And that's how we got started and I met a guy from Newcastle uh, and a French guy Roger Swiss, and they got me involved in uh, the worm fishing, showed me what to do, and I ended up having to buy different stuff while I was up there and whatever, and caught my first sea trout on the second day, which is one of those things that you never forget, because it was just absolutely unbelievable experience. And that's how it started, and it's gone on from there. But it's not just fishing in Scotland. I've lived in various places. I've lived in Wales and uh, fished to Conway, and worm fished on there, but a, a different technique altogether. Where it was just straightforward trotting a worm down a river, not, I must say this, not static fishing. I never ever fish static. It's something that I don't do. I like to keep the worm moving. Once I feel a fish, then I don't let them swallow the worm or anything like that. I just hit them and that's it. And exactly the same when we're upstream worming as well. And the reason I do it more than anything is that I enjoy it. I fly fish when I'm up in Scotland. I always fish the fly in the morning and the worm in the afternoon. So not they're just a purist worm fisher. Give us a brief potted history of worm fishing for salmon generally. Well, initially started off, as I said, worm fishing and got involved on fishing the Kent up in Kendall. And there it was just a case of a single hook and a single worm. And then started to go up to Scotland and uh, fishing the Arn up in Toronto and got into upstream worming. And there are different ways that uh, people do it up there. Mainly it's a single worm on either a Stuart tattle or a Pennell tattle, or sometimes even on a single hook. But other guys do it and put three worms on to make it look like an octopus or, or whatever you want to call it, something that's pulsing in the water. But then a lot of the guys fishing that way up in Toronto will let the salmon take the worm and then feed it three or four yards of line so that it will move out of its lie and then eventually return to its lie. But by then it swallowed the hook and it's down its throat. Now... To me, that's not the way to do it because of the rules now up in Scotland where all henfish have to be returned. You want it hooked in the mouth or in the scissors so that you can actually remove the hook quite easily or hooks, whichever it is, and put the fish back really without taking them out of the water. On the ribble, I tend to fish just a normal across and down and move one step every cast so that I cover a bigger expanse of water. And that would happen on most of the rivers that I fish. Down in, in Wales, when I lived down there, there are places where you could go, lots of rivers that are whitewater rivers, full of rocks and boulders and whatever, 
and it, it's fished again as an upstream worm rather than a down and across. The upstream worm fishing, the idea of that, of course, is to get the the worm down into the white water behind the boulders, which is full of oxygen, and that's where the fish lie. And that's the reason for casting upstream, to get it down so you work it through the rocks and boulders until you get it in the right position. And that's a fantastic feeling when you, you get it right, you know it's gone over the rock, and you feel it go down and then start to move through, and then bang, and off it goes. It's a fabulous feeling, it really is. Do you think that worming is more acceptable in Scotland and Wales than perhaps it is in England? Or are there rivers where, for much of the time, worming is the only realistic way of fishing at all, thereby giving it localised credibility? Yes, there are places where it's necessary to do it more. The guys up in Tointow have started to fish the um, fly a lot more than they ever did, but you tend to fish the tails of the pools when you're when doing that, rather than the white water. And a lot of it is done by, you know, sort of up across and down, and then strip the line back to give the fly movement, so that um, it induces the take which is a different way of doing things, but they've adapted to it and whatever, and some of the guys are quite successful at it, but still fish the worm as well, doing what like I did when I was up last month, whereby I fished the worm in the afternoon and the fly in the morning, because I enjoyed doing that. It was good fun, but never touched a fish on the fly, but was quite successful on the worm. The actual business of worm fishing, as you said in your question about where you would fish it and whatever, it's wildly regarded as being a good way of catching fish and different methods are used in different places. I fished the nith where that's very very popular for worm fishing as is the fly but a lot more fish I would say were probably caught on the worm than they are on the fly. The Annan is fish like that, I fish the Annan that's a that's a worm fishing river. A lot are, even the Tay and I've, I've been on, on various beats on the Tay and by invitation whereby there, is, always, there are always worms available and people do fish it now, I'm not saying they do that on the spare because I've only ever been on the spare once, so and, and that was fly fishing only. But I've never been there, and I don't know. And then various other rivers that I fish, the Till, you worm fish it, down in North Wales, various rivers down there. There's lots and lots and lots of rivers where you actually fish the worm, but it tends to be more down and across rather than white water in a lot of the, those sort of rivers because there isn't the amount of white water there that you would get like you do on the Arn up in Scotland, or the Glaslin or the Riada in Wales. It's just one of those things that you adapt to due to the type of river that you're fishing. Arguably, more than any other aspect of river fishing, salmon fishing is affected by conditions. Apart from making the prospects more difficult, certain types of conditions can also make the more practical side of things difficult too, in that changing water heights, for example, can dictate what you're allowed or not allowed to do in terms of approach. That said, unlike spinning and fly fishing, worm fishing can theoretically, and in most cases also practically, be done right across the board. So would it not make sense for more salmon anglers to become proficient at doing it? And why is it then that the purist element tend to look down on it in the way they do? Basically, I would say with that, it's because they have not tried it. They assume that because you fish the worm, that you do what I said in the earlier part of the conversation, they've not tried it. They assume that every salmon that you take has swallowed the worms, they're down the throat and whatever, and then if you need to put it back, it's a deep hooking problem and you can't really get the hooks out. A lot of people in doing that, and it's something that does happen, because they, they always say that the salmon will get shut of the hooks and everything, is cut the line and put the fish back with the hook inside it. That's something I'm not awfully sure of, so I would rather not do that. So again, try and get it hooked in the mouth if you can, or in the scissors which is the best way of returning the fish without damage. Going back to the fly purists, it's a situation where they really do look down their nose at it, but again, it's an ignorance because they haven't tried it. Probably don't want to try it, I don't know. But they're very self-opinionated about it, I must state that. And again, I've talked to people about it who, in conversation, have said that, well, they haven't tried it. And I said, well, why are you making a, a bit of a song and dance about it when you don't even know what you're talking about? It is a problem, it is a problem in it, but most of the places where I go, it's accepted and I don't have any trouble with it. But people making comments about it and talking about it, they know nothing about it, shouldn't do so, in my opinion. But there are tactical ways of getting around deep hooking fish for release, so even that need not be an issue. Once you feel they're taking everything, just lift your hand into it. If it comes off, it comes off, but if it's hooked in the mouth, 
then you can play it out or whatever, you can put it back without causing any damage. As I said to you about the guys up in Tomato fishing the three worms, they tend to do it and give the fish yards of line so that it moves out of its lie and then goes back again. And by that time, that's when it's swallowed out. That's so they don't lose it. That's the reason. But now, because of rules about all hen fish being returned, you've got to be very careful what you're doing. But it doesn't have to be that way. So can we now start looking more closely at the practice itself, and more to the point, what you do so successfully that others perhaps don't? It's worth pointing out here that due to your acknowledged expertise with the technique, you also get invites up to Scotland to demonstrate and instruct specifically on this subject. So can we start by looking at the tackle and terminal setup? I tend to use um, an 11 foot spinning rod with 12 pound main line and then a 10 pound cast with a spinning reel. Sometimes use blade, but mostly uh, nylon. Upstream worming, like to use a um, gold line. This is so that you can actually see it when it's in the water and you know where it's going when it's going in between the boulders and not. If you can't see it, you tend to get stuck a lot more than what you would do if you use um, a gold coloured line that you can actually see. Hoop sizes, terminal tattle, this is all down to um, regulations and whatever. Up in Scotland and in most places, now size 8 hook and that's it, you can't use anything larger. The weight to get it down up in Scotland tend to use what we call a lead spring, which is basically a piece of lead wire. It's quite a thin stuff that you've been wrapped around the shaft of an old screwdriver that you slide onto the line and then turn down to get it into the tight onto the line. And, and fish that below a swivel, probably 18 inches away from the actual hooks or hook, depending on which way you're fishing it. Up in Tom and Towel, I tend to use a panel tattle, which is two hooks, and again, two size eights, and a single worm. Very rare do I use three worms up in that part of Scotland, but on the Nith, again, using a, a different method, using what we call a bouncing betty or a bait controller, which can be various things, plastic tubing with a swivel in the end of it, with lead in the other end, or little rubber balls. But again, the lead spring is again another way of doing it, and the idea of that, of course, is when it's down in the bottom of the river, if you get it stuck, it's easy enough to pull it back out again, and then it will then carry on fishing. The weight being on the bottom and the, the worms probably a foot higher away from the uh, rocks and boulders. And again, on that sort of fishing up in Scotland, on the Nith especially, a single hook and three worms, because that's the type of way that they, or the type of fishing that they do up there. And that's absolutely fabulous thing. And it's a great sensation on take, because that invariably, as soon as you feel that, you can strike into it and, you, and hook it in the mouth and whatever. And then if necessary, especially at the end of the season, where fish are getting coloured, you can put the fish back, which regulations now is something that you must do. Are there any tactical ways of getting around snagging the bottom and risking losing gear? It is a problem, but I think that's something that the, the more you fish it, the easier it becomes. The more you get used to it. I think one of the ways to do it is to keep lifting your rod so that as it's going along the bottom, it, it, you're actually making it bounce by down in the water and then up. Only six inches or so, but it's just enough to move it. But then, of course, that gives the worm movement as well which is an attractor to the salmon or the sea trout, whichever it is that you're actually fishing for. The bouncing betties tend to be a little rubber ball with a swivel on it, which you mount on a, a three-way swivel with your main line in one end, your hook length on the other, and then a little piece of line with the uh, rubber ball on it off the, the third leg, like a dropper would be off a fly line. And it does work quite well, that, but you need a reasonable flow of water for it to work. On the ribble, I've used bait controllers, I have used bouncing betties and whatever. And again, because you've not got this great fast flow and whatever, you've got to be careful on size to make sure that you've not got something too heavy that's going to get you stuck in the bottom. And a new way, if you're getting your hook stuck now, of course, is to use circle hooks, which is something that's come over from America, which I've read about on the internet, which I haven't tried yet because I haven't been able to get hold of any. And from my own experience of using circle hooks at sea, I know they give you a much better chance of hooking fish in the scissor. Yes, and of course, because it is a turtle, it stops it staying on the bottom as well, getting hooked up into the rocks. The point about this worm fishing is, well, that you do tend to lose tattle you, because it's the nature of the fishing, so you, you go well prepared. I'm advised here that I should also ask you about slinkies, though I must confess, I've absolutely no idea whatsoever what they are. Slinkies are a new way of waiting 
instead of using a bouncing Betty or a bait controller that I've described, this is something again that's come over from America. And it's a piece of parachute cord. And you cut it into certain lengths and whatever. And you seal the end up by heating it because of the nature of the material. And then the other end, you feed split shot into it of various, depending on the diameter of your parachute cord, fiddly, awkward job to do, but it becomes a knack and it doesn't take long to get used to doing it. And again, it's fished with circle hooks. That's where this came from. And it was a way of, again, of stopping it getting snagged on the bottom. But in the internet stuff that we came through that we've printed off, it does say, but you will still get stuck. But I've tried it, and yes, it does work. It's okay. You've also mentioned in passing different hook setups. The single hook is self-explanatory, but what about your take on panel plus Stuart rigs? Can you now talk us through these two? I tend to cut a piece of nylon, probably about 15, 16 inches long, and then mount a hook onto the line by feeding the, the uh, nylon through and then locking it in position with a little piece of plastic tubing and then tying the second hook on as you would normally tie a hook on and space it about three quarters of an inch above the other hook. So you've got one on the point and then you've got one three quarters of an inch higher up and then you put the worm on across the hook. A Stuart Tattle is exactly the same thing but three hooks where it's just a more secure way of holding the worm that you can keep it dead straight so it looks like a natural worm floating down the river. So you've got these three hook setup variations available to you. What then would be the deciding factor regarding which one you actually choose to use? Uh, Where you are actually fishing. Single hook I would use on uh, rivers like the Ribble, the Conway, the um, Kent, the Annan, and then use the Stuart Tattle and the Pennell Tattle on a whitewater river like the Arn or the Glasslyn or the Riada in, in North Wales, because they're all rocks and boulders rivers. That's the reason for using that. You touched briefly there on the worms themselves in terms of why the different terminal presentations are selected to present them. So can we now take a close look at the subject of worms? Well, <laughs> you're getting to something quite interesting now, because times have changed. And when I first started fishing the worm, we just used lobworms, which are the ordinary bug standard garden worms. But since then, superworms have come into the equation. Never fished them, so I don't really know what they are. And then there are dendrobenus, again, which to me a dendrobena would be a worm that you would get out of a midden, very, very wriggly. But people have developed a stronger worm, which is bigger than the standard uh, midden type worm, brandling, which is what it's known as. And again, it's to give it more action in the water. Now, the guys up in Toronto love a dendrobena because they can fish that on, as, on a single hook, especially when they're sea trout fishing, May and June and July, which is really, really the top sea trout months up in uh, up in Toronto along the arm. And they're very successful with it. I have a colleague uh, over in Ripon, fishes it all the time. Very, very rare does he fish the uh, lobworm anymore. Now, as I said earlier in the interview, but the importance of having the right worms when I went up to Scotland, of course, the first time, and didn't know it was a, a worm in river, I hadn't got any worms. So you start, you know, sort of like, well, where do you go? Or do you get all the worms and whatever? And, well, they said, well, you'll have to wait until the evening, till it goes dark, and, and the hope it's a bit damp, and there's no stars or no moon, you want cloud cover, and no wind. And then what? Well, you have to, you've got to get a tub, and you've got to go out onto the lawns outside the hotel with a torch, and initially... Not knowing, just go with an ordinary touch. But then they, they said, well, no, you need a red filter on them. And various things like that. But anyway, we were quite successful and we got, you know, sort of collecting worms and getting hold of them and holding them till they release and then put them in the box and then putting them in moss, etc., etc. And it got that that was the only way that we, we could get hold of, of worms for the, for the first time we went. But after that, obviously, I've done it on the lawns round here at night. I've been up on the golf course and, and got them off the golf course because there's always plenty of worms on the golf course because of the way that the grass is mown, which is quite short grass. And the hotel one, when we were up there, we actually got um, locked out of the hotel one night. And in the early days when we went, one had to dress for dinner. Of course, we were in suits. And I went back in again. And where I'd been like, on my haunches picking the worms up and everything, I walked into the uh, bedroom after having to throw stones up at the window to get my wife up to let me let me in. And... Uh, the bottom of my suit jacket was absolutely coated in worm casts and that, which didn't make me very popular. But I can still do it, and I've still done it. I actually got uh, the Leyland Police one evening stopping to ask me what the hell I was doing, collecting worms, and they both shook their heads and said, well, I've heard everything now. Then they wanted to know what for, and when I said it was for salmon fishing, 
She said, I didn't know you fished for salmon with worms. I said, what do you do? And are you successful? I said, well, I'd like to think so. So she said, well, we'll leave you to it. <laughs> Good night, sir, and drove away. So, uh, yes, and then the other thing that we do, the most important thing, of course, when you've got your worms, is to look after them, especially if you're up there for two weeks. So... Most of the time now, I tend to buy my worms. I have a very good friend in uh, Southport, Bill Baxter, his name is, who was a, a grower. Grew the best French beans I've ever tasted in my life. But through knee problems, I had to pack it in. Anyway, he got into the worming job and everything. But he supplies worms now to uh, tattle shops, etc., etc. But does a retail business as well. So I tend to buy my worms off Bill and ring up and order them and decone them in and just like some uh, soil mix and, and whatever. And I'm, I'm nearly certain they come from Canada that they've flown in to Manchester Airport on a, a weekly basis, and it would appear that a lot of the people selling worms now, and that is where they get them from. But there are worm farms, and people do have worm farms, and where they grow them on, there's one up in uh, Yorkshire that's very good, Tommy Topsoil, his, his, his name is. And then the other thing that we do is, if possible, keep them in sphagnum moss. And sphagnum moss hardens the worms off so that they don't, when you hook them, they don't just like come off the hook. They're actually really, really good once they've been in sphagnum moss. And you will find up in Tommy Tell that there is so much moss up there in the forest and one thing or another, you don't have to worry about it. Just go and help yourself. And I tend to do it if I'm up there for a week, I'll change it halfway through the week and put some fresh moss in. Or if I'm there for two weeks, then I might do it through two or three times. And would it be advisable also to keep them in a cool box? Well, you've got to keep them cool. That's the most important thing, yes. Don't leave them in the back of the car. In fact... Different people had different ways of doing it, and one guy in particular, who was the chief engineer at Bourneville, Cabris Chocolate Place, and his name was Mr. Mann, M-A-N-N, a great, great character, good fisherman, and he had a device in his BMW that kept his boot open about three inches to let air in so he could leave his worms in the back of his car. It's something he designed himself to go around the lock. But as an engineer, there's uh, not a problem. But the idea is to try and keep them as cool as you possibly can, and Cellars are a good place to keep them, and beer cellars especially. There's a refrigeration in there, which is down to a certain level, so we keep it at floor level, then they'll keep fresh for ages. If they get warm, then you can forget it, they'll just die. And the other thing, of course, is to feed them. And I once bought some worms off a guy, who shall be nameless, and when they came, uh, without any shadow of a doubt, they were dead. And he told me to go to a vet and get some antibiotic and give them the antibiotic and they would be okay. I said, but they're dead. I said, you really can't revive something that's dead. Anyway, he ended up having to send me fresh worms, but instead of them being here in Leyland, I had to get them sent up to Scotland. So I got up there with no worms, which was rather annoying, because, like everything else, the prices have risen and risen and risen. And the only guy, really, that I find now sensible price-wise is, uh, is Bill Baxter locally. The only thing is I have to go and pick them up. So you've got the added cost of the petrol, but, I mean, that's, that doesn't matter, really. So how then do you go about feeding worms? Damp newspaper and put it in amongst the sphagnum moss and you'll be amazed how much of it disappears if you're keeping them any length of time. Sometimes when we, when I come back and still got worms, I'll put some fresh moss in and then dump some uh, newspaper in and just shred some newspaper up, wet it and put it inside the moss and everything and then you can always see where they've, they've actually, you know, so the worms have eaten it and whatever. Other people tend to put um, peelings off vegetables because that rots down anyway, you know, so it's easy enough, and it's, as it goes soft, then it, it must be easy for the worms to digest it. What is it, then, that governs worm presentation, either as a single, a double, or a bunch? Is that down to regulations, or more a matter of personal choice? No, I think more, more to do with the type of fishing. If I was on the ribble, I would tend to use... I've done it with a single worm, but not with any great success. I'm always better with uh, two, three, probably three worms on because it's a slower moving river than one that's the actual worms whizzing past the salmon, which you'll feel they're taking one out. The, the thing is, of course, right on the river, you'll pick the uh, coarse fish up as well. So I've got some rather nice barbel doing that, and uh, and some big chub as well. Barbel up to 10, 12 pound, and um, chub, 4, 5 pound, 6 pound, you know, so I've, I've had some nice fish doing that. And I've had my first year of salmon as well. And sea trout. We've got a beautiful sea trout at the end of last season just before the sea trout uh, season finished, it was an absolute silver bar, fresh as a daisy. And boy, did it fight. And that was three worm at single hook. And there were, it was hooked in the scissors. And there was no way that was going to come off it. But it was, it was an absolutely beautiful fish, around about three pounds. Now, I believe that from a salmon angling perspective, there are right and wrong ways of presenting a worm or worms. 
Well, with the three worm, it doesn't really matter. But on the single worm, this was something an old guy showed me on the Kent many, many years ago when I I tattled up and he said, you've got your worm on upside down. I said, how do you mean I've got it upside down? He said, well, you should have that end that you got at the bottom at the top. He said, because that's the bit that they take, which is the tail of the worm, was how he explained it. So now when I'm using um, panel tattle or shirt tattle, that's how I would do it. So the tail end of it will be on the top hook because the salmon will go for that, which would give you a better chance of hooking it, rather than it being on the other way around where it could nip it off and miss the hook. That's how the guy explained it to me. And I actually fished one of the uh, tributaries of the tail with some friends, and um, they were spinning, and I said to them, can we not worm it? Of course you can worm it, but we've never done it. Will you show us how to do it then? And I, this is what I did, and I did, and I put the uh, worm on, and the, the gilly on the, on the bait was a great, great character, a real character. And he came up and he said, boy, he said, you've got the worm on upside down. I said, no, I haven't. And I said, that's the correct way. I said, so I was told many, many years ago by a guy like yourself on the Kent. And he said, well, he said, I can't believe that. He said, but what a good idea, because that's the bit that they take first, not the bit that's dangling down, the bit at the top. And I said, yeah. And with that, I hooked a fish, by the way, and that's gospel truth. And played this fish and got it. Well, that was, he was convinced then. That's a few years ago now, but it was rather nice, a nice place to go. But again, very much lent to uh, whitewater fishing, you know, sort of the, the upstream worm. What then is the attraction of a worm or any other food item to a fish that supposedly doesn't feed in fresh water? It's an aggravation thing, isn't it? It's something that's, that's moving, that's going past. It's all it can because it's the same with the fly. It's the movement of the fly. They've brought all these different materials out now for, uh, for flies that make flies pulse and, and, and the glitter and whatever. And it's just the actual movement of it when it's going past. Because on a whitewater river it's a single worm, it's, it's a natural thing going past and they just grab it. Now actually it might be a good time to compare typical catch rates for bait, spinners and the fly. Perhaps even touching on why each might prevail under certain sets of conditions. I would say probably that the more successful would be spinning because of the aggravation effect of the, of the actual spinner with the blades and the movement of them, and they're designed in such a way. And I would say probably that there are more fish caught on spinners than on anything else. But obviously on, on fly fishing rivers only, which some are, then you can only spin when the water's above a certain height, etc. Then I would say then the fly is successful, such as on the tay, the tweed, which are mostly fly fishing. The tay is very, very much fly fishing, worm fishing, spinning type of river, rather than sort of being a purist fly water. And most of the rivers up above Inverness, up in that part of Scotland, would tend to be fly fishing only. Very rare you would hear of them spinning up there, even in high water they seem to frown on it. The blame seems to be put back onto anglers now for the lack of fishing in, in the water, like they used to be, and I'm afraid I don't agree with that. I think a lot of it's got to do with this marine harvesting and the way that they found out where the, the uh, salmon are in the sea when they're making their way back to the rivers from Greenland, etc, etc. How well does the worm hold up compared to other beds? Worm fishing is very successful. They are up in Scotland, I would say, more fish are caught on the worm than on anything else, because it's fish more than anything else. As in some of the rivers in North Wales, which are white water rivers. One of the guys that I got friendly with was from Clandidno Junction. He, unfortunately, he's dead now, but he was an absolute, he was an artist, up to uh, Worthing, and he fished at Dolwyth Ellen, which is on the Cledder, which is the main tributary of the Conway. And that, again, is a white water river, and that's where he used to, uh, he used to fish. He was a member of a club up there, and he caught an awful lot of salmon on the worm. So, it has its uses. Like I said, it's not something I do all the time. I've been fly fishing twice this last week, so I like the fly fishing, but I think circumstances dictate cases and I, I quite like to fish the worm as and when it's necessary as I said earlier sort of the last time I was up there I had five in a day and I'd fished the worm at that particular day I'd fished it in different places on the river right from first thing in the morning but I'd fished it for half an hour and then gone somewhere else for half an hour and then gone somewhere else for half an hour and I did it like that but I ended up getting five fish in the day and the biggest was well over £25, which is the biggest salmon I've ever caught. Unfortunately, all henfish and I'll have to go back. But it doesn't matter. They've had the sport out of it, and they've gone back to make their babies, you know, which is a good thing, isn't it? 
Can I ask a potentially stupid question now? Why must the worm be fished upstream? Quite simply, it's in order to get the worm with the weight down into the bottom. Because of the speed of the river, especially on the Arn up in Tomintel, it's the fastest flowing river in the British Isles. It's very, very quick. And if you threw it across to let it go downstream, it would basically fit in the surface film. What you need to do is to get it down in the bottom into the situation where the fish are lying in the oxygenated water behind the boulders. So the idea is to throw it upstream and work it with your rod. You've got a line in one hand and the rod in the other and you, you fish it down so that, and you feel it actually, feel it go down into the hole and you wait then and as it goes down you feel the weight drop and the worm goes down and then bang, that's when they take it. So that's the reason that you need to do it like that because once it's gone through that hole, within two or three yards, it's back up in the surface film again because it's the force of the water has lifted it back up. The turbulence lifts it back up again. So then it's out again, put it back on again. And the thing is, you're doing a cast every, oh, well, I don't know, every 15, 20 seconds, I suppose. Uh, by the time you've, by, you've you cast you cast it across, flick the bail arm down, down behind the rock, out and up, probably, th- but, well, at the most 30 seconds. So you need really, really... Good tattle. The modern spinning reels where you don't, the bail arm springs are guaranteed for life and things like that. So important because that was something that we always used to carry in the old days was, was bail arm springs. Became an expert <laughs> with bail arm springs, fitted them and whatever. And, um, always made sure that we had a spare with us because it was something that was very hard to get hold of up in Scotland. And we used to have to go to a fishing tattle shop in Elgin in the old days because that was the only place we could buy the uh, springs. But he always had a good stock, so he was a great guy to know. Well, that's the reason for it. That's where they lie. They lie in the oxygenated water. And that's the reason why you would, would fish it there. But the salmon side of it, where you see them when they're laid in the pools and everything, up on the arm, it's very difficult to get at them because you can't get it down. It looks like it's not moving. But once it gets down into the water and goes down and everything, it tends to drop straight down. And then when it gets down near the bottom, then it starts to move. But it only goes through very, very slowly. So again, it would be a situation where if you were fishing pools, you would tend to fish it with a little rubber ball to get it to bounce through and whatever, rather than using a, um, you know, sort of a, a weight or a lead weight. And, and lead in, obviously, in, in brackets type of thing, because it's, uh, it's not something that you use a lot anymore. You know, lead is it? It tends to be these uh, different uh, things. But we still talk about lead because that's something we've been brought up with. The other way, of course, and, and, and again, to stop you getting stuck and whatever, that I tend, as I'm going through, I just move my hand up and down, and as it's going through and it's fishing, which gives the, the worm the movement as well, whatever, but it lifts it away from the boulders and whatever. So I think that I probably don't get stuck as much as what other people do. And I fish with people, and they said to me, why do you do that? Said, well, it stops me getting stuck, and it gives the action to the worm, like you would do with a fly, when you mend it up, and just to get it to fish differently. It's an attractor. The attraction is the important thing. And if you do get stuck, what should you do to try and get yourself out of it? Invariably, it's gone into behind the rock the way that it's, it's gone down the river. So the tendency is then is just to move back two paces, stick your rod further out and flick it. It will invariably come out. If it doesn't, it's usually the lead has gone in between two pieces of, of rock and whatever, and then you would lose the terminal tattle. But sometimes it's the hook. If you've not been lifting, not concentrating properly, and you get the hook stuck, well, you just lose the hook length then, and, and then you change that and put a new one on. Keep it top pocket it fishing jacket. What then is the difference in terms of messages transmitting up the line to you between a snag and a hook fish? Invariably, you don't recognise that you're stuck. You don't feel it going. It's a, it's a funny thing. A, a take is you feel it pluck on the line, but when it gets stuck and it's gone in behind something, you actually see it in the line. It's something that's a visual that you, and it's something that you learn. So that's the reason for keep lifting it and lifting it and lifting it. And then when you do get stuck, when you think, well, how, why has that done that? You can't understand it. But then you go upstream and then just flick it. But majority, pull it the wrong way. You're pulling it into the rock instead of taking it out. So with me being left-handed and the river flowing from my right to my left, if it goes in there, then I would automatically move back that way. Go two paces back upstream flick it out and then go back to where I was and carry on fishing again or just carry on fishing from that point and go down again. If it's the other way and it's flowing from my left to my right, well, it's not so bad for me that time, but I can just like, put my hand out and flick it upstream and, and get it out that way. But are there not also messages being sent up the line that while they're not takes, could be mistaken for a fish? Or can you tell the difference? 
that's something that you learn over the years and everything. That takes me back that because it, it was good. Actually, a guy called Graham was from Wolverhampton, never fished the arm before. Great, great character. He was a seller of scrap metal too. When he did come into the scrapyard, he then sold it on, like for reclamation, for reprocessing and all that sort of thing. And as I said, he was an, an absolutely amazing character. He'd been um, a coarse fisher all his life. And as soon as, it, as the worm hit the water, as he cast it in, then he twitched. And he twitched it backwards all the time. You know, he flicked it back, flicked it back, flicked it back and flicked it back. And, it, and eventually caught a fish. But he was doing that because he could feel it. You can feel it bouncing. You, you know, sort of, if you get it the right place, you can feel it bouncing. You can feel it bump. When something takes, it takes you so gentle at times. On other times, they're vicious bangs. That that is the thing, you know. But because he was doing that, that's how how he the fish and everything. Because he was plucking it back all the time, so it, it looked very odd when he was doing it. And that's what, so that's from long, 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 long time ago now. And whether he still goes up there or not, I don't know. But he he, he did catch, he did catch. But that's what he did. He just kept flicking it back, flicking it back, flicking it to stop it getting stuck. That's what it was about. And what's the difference in timing between lip hooking and deep hooking a fish? Ooh, well, when you lip hook. As soon as you feel it, you lift your hand up. I mean, that's an immediate thing. You can talk, well, it depends. If you do what Roy, one of the guys used to do, where he used to fish the three worms, he would give it like three yards of line and wait and, and the fish would move and then go into a different lie and then it would go back into the lie that it came from because there was no resistance. It didn't feel anything. It didn't know it was attached to anything. But then as soon as it went back into its original lie, he would wind in then until it tightened and then he'd lift his... So you could, you, it could be up to a minute, minute and a half. But presumably, deep hooked as a result. Yep, yeah, but it was hooked down the throat, so, you, so you're in a situation then where you've got to get the hook out of them without damaging the fish. Because if a, a fish is bleeding, and when you put it back in the water, how do you know that thing's ever going to survive? Probably bleed to death. Now you mentioned earlier, before the voice recorder was switched on, the importance of learning the stretch of water you're fishing, of knowing every detail of the bottom layout. Your actual words were having the ability to see it in 3D. Yes. Well, I don't know about 3D. You want to look at what your bottom is. And the thing is now, with Polaroid glasses, it's made it so much easier and whatever. All the good guys, they, well, I wouldn't fish without having a pair of glasses on anyway because it's so dangerous not to have them on. But the thing is with the Polaroids and everything, and, and like they are, you learn the river, you learn as you're going down, you're looking at it all the time. So you're fishing, but you're... Watching what's going on as well, and where where the line's going, and where it goes down in a hole, and where it doesn't, and you learn, you know, sort of the depth of the river, the ribble where I fished down at um, Riverside Farm, that's altered due to the floods and whatever, and that doesn't fish now anything like it did last year. It's a different thing altogether. And as you're wading down, those holes appeared where they didn't used to be holes anymore. And you think, well, that, you know, see, so you've got to come back because if you walked in it, you'd probably go down to your waist in it. And all right, you've got the right gear on, but it's not a case of that, is it? It's you've, you're looking so that you know that you're fishing and you're hoping that the lies are still there that they used to be. Well, they're not. They've, they've moved. The lies have gone because it's filled up with gravel. And there's certainly, I haven't seen fish in that part of the ribble for, well, this season, I've been about half a dozen times, I've never seen a fish. Not a splash, not a rise, anything. When the water's been at really, really good quality. I've hooked some funny things out, but I haven't hooked any fish. <laughs> lead weights that have been like not near enough a pound of lead on a on a curtain hoop type thing, and and I actually hooked it with the hoop, not the line or anything like that, gone through the loop. But you find amazing things. Then so you you learn your depths. Uh, yeah. That's that's the important thing. Where to fish, where to cast. When we go on the Nith, we fish a section of river up there on mid the uh, Nithsdale, and there's a river comes in on a bend called a scar. And just below that, it's quite deep, but it's full of big boulders. And you know it's full of big boulders. And you, you get to know where to cast, where you can actually get the worm to go through the boulders rather than getting stuck. And I've gone through it, and my wife's come down behind me and fished exactly the same way, same weight, same worms, etc., etc. I've hooked, she hasn't. And we can never understand that. So change round. You go first, and then go through. I follow it out. I hook, she doesn't. So we, you don't know, do you? It's watercraft, I think. But I think that's the way to explain it. And it's the same fly fishing. Yeah, yeah. When you go on a good river and you get a guide, a gilly, that knows the water and everything, he'll put you where the fish are. He'll tell you where they are. He knows where they are because that's his job. So it's watercraft, isn't it? And you learn that. And when you're on your own, you've got to make sure you know what you're doing. You really do have to know. 
you have to know your river. Put yourself in the situation now of someone visiting the Whitewater River for the very first time, but with the experience of watercraft that you've accumulated over the years. Obviously, there are going to be features common to both situations that you'll be looking out for as worth putting a bait through. So can you outline for us what you will be looking for and what you'll be hoping to see? Well, again, it would be what you're looking at. It would be exactly what you're looking at. You would look at it and you think, well, that's fishy and that's not fishy. I'll try that first. So sort of, and sometimes it kicks you up the backside because that doesn't work and that does. But normally it's an expertise thing. It's something that you've... I've been doing this a long time now, 40 years. And you look at it and you think, well, that'll be fishy. And it's not. And then you look at something, nah, that'll be... And then you first cast it, bang, you're on. So it's a visual thing. You're actually looking at it and where the fish will be lying. Are you then looking for runs of white water with small still areas indicating lies downstream? You actually see that. You see where the water comes over the boulder, then that will be a glide, or that will be a glide down there. And then there'll be another boulder there, and there'll be another glide down there. So you would fish it and start off at that one. So fish through that one, then that one, and then that one, and when you get bang, you get it. You just don't know, but it might take on that one. It depends on the boulder and the glide and what and how deep the water is behind. And sometimes, if you stand still and watch, you get like a, a mirror where it goes dead calm, dead flat, and you can actually see, and you can see the fish. You know they're there, but they, they might not take. A friend of mine was fishing on the arm last year, was it? Might have been a year before, two years ago, and he had a, a gilly with him who knew the river very, very well, and he had 17 casts in one spot over one boulder. And he said, it'll take eventually, there's a fish there, I'm telling you there's a fish there, 17th cast, bang, it took it. So you've got to know it, you've got to know it, and you've got to know where your fish lie and everything. How small then can these holding pools be? Oh, they can be a foot long, they can be two foot long. If there's a hole there, there'll be a fish, especially sea trout. The sea trout love that white water and whatever, you know, it goes over the top of the rocket. And I mean virtually casting it on top of the rock, and inching it and inching it so that it, it then, then eventually it falls in and drops straight down. Bang! And they're on. So you, you can never tell, Phil. You can never tell. And how might favoured fish lies change with differing water heights? Well, they do. That's the big thing. They do. Up there, what happens when the water comes up, it goes peaty. And it goes very, very peaty. And it's like strong black coffee. And it, there's something, they just go off the take then. You might as well not bother fishing. It spoils it all together. But once it starts to fine off again, and the peatiness starts to go out of the water, they will start to take again. And it might be then that it might be a foot above normal level. But then as it drops off and drops off and drops off, and then of course the fish are all always moving up, aren't they? So you're getting fresh fish coming up because you've had a flood. One day this year, I must have seen in the afternoon 35, 40 fish actually rise out of the water, coming in a pool and coming out of the pool into the glide where the white water was. And I, I hooked two fish out of that total. So where did they go? You just don't know. And you move up and try and fish it down and down and down and down and there's just nothing. And then you get back down to the tail of the pool and then bang, you know, the neck of the pool and bang, you get a fish. So it's very strange, very strange. Widening the subject of bait up a little, can we now quickly touch on two other approaches? Firstly, the shrimp, which is a bait, and secondly, the bead, which mimics a bait, but doesn't sit inside the fly fishing or spinning categories. The shrimp is the thing that's frowned on more so than the worm will ever be. Because it's, it's natural food for a salmon, you see. If you go to a fishmonger's and get a shrimp, it's in a, a circle shape, if you will. And then what do you do? You put a pin through it to straighten it up, which is on your line. And then you put a treble hook underneath its chin. And hook one hook of the treble into the egg cell that's underneath its chin. And that's what the salmon goes for. You can fish that upstream, or you can fish it with a float, or to people fish it with a float. A lot of the guys in uh, one of the big angling clubs around here, from down in Cheshire, they have stretches where they fish on the opposite bank to us, one up in Ribchester, it comes to mind, and they shrimp down this pool where we're not allowed to do it. But I haven't fished the shrimp for oh, a long, 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 long time. I used to fish it when I lived down in uh, on the Conway, but down there they used to do it in one of the pools where they used to climb up in the trees above the what they called the dump pool where the sewage outflow was into the river and they used to cast the shrimp upstream and let it drop down and they used to look in you know through polaroids on and they could see the salmon laid there. Because as the salmon's laid it opens its mouth and closes it. So you see a white oval 
and then it disappears, and then a white oval as it opens its mouth again. And what they would do, they would take it down, and the shrimp would be sucked in by the salmon as it took a breath, and as it closed its mouth, they would then lift their hand up. But many a time, as the shrimp went in, and I've actually seen this, they would blow it out, and it would come jet propelled backwards the way that it had come. It's fascinating to see that, but a lot of the guys down there didn't fish anything else but the shrimp, unless it was full water, and then they would spin. Now, the bead is something that's coming in America, and having been lucky enough to go over to Alaska on holiday, we were taken on the Kenai River, and um, we had these beads. What they did, they took us out on a boat, on a, a Willis speedboat, which was the most fantastic experience ever. The speed you went up this river, and the size of the river and everything else, was just an amazing thing. But then when you got up to the top and they switched the, the motor off and everything, and dropped me down on anchor, and then um, rigged this tattle up, and basically what you had was a sight indicator on a fly line, and then you had an island leader of about 12 pounds, which was attached to that, it was a, a number eight single hook, but above the hook, fastened on, was a salmon imitation, salmon egg, the bead, as they called it, which was pegged in position with a toothpick, so Roddy the gilly and the guy would have permanently in his mouth a toothpick with a bead on it, so that if the one you were fishing with didn't work, he would say, bring it in, and he would take the hook off, take the bead off, chuck it away, put another bead on, peg it on, two inches above the hook and whatever, and then you'd start fishing again. And the bead, you cast upstream, that side of the boat, and as it got past the boat, as soon as it got past you, the bead would come up like that. So you picked it up, cast it back again, and then once the bead went under the water, then you knew you had a fish on, and they were all hooked on the outside of the mouth, not the inside. So if it got up the side of the boat, and it, it was a king salmon, which was out of season, which was what my wife called, 35 pounds plus king salmon, all he did eventually was lean over the side of the boat, pair along those players, flick the hook out, and the fish was away. And that is what they do. But there, mainly, they're trying to catch wild rainbow trout. And they're carnivorous, aren't they? They eat the eggs, etc., etc. And so you're imitating a salmon egg. There's, there's thousands of salmon, so there's millions of eggs are actually floating down the river. So it's just an intriguing way of fishing. Tried here, but didn't work. And the other thing they fish there, of course, is salmon eggs, where the guide will, when he guts the fish and everything, will take the salmon eggs away and process them so that when you actually fish in, and fishing like it would a normal ledger with a weight on and then a leader with a hook on with the eggs stuffed inside it and chuck it upstream and bounce it down the bottom and as it comes past you, pick it up and put it back again. But unfortunately, when we were doing that, the river was too high and it was washing it past too quick. So we ended up spinning, but that was a, an amazing experience. Absolutely fantastic. Well, that's what the bead's about. I would imagine the man that invented it has made himself an absolute fortune because wherever you go in the fishing tackle shop, there's boxes and boxes upon boxes of these salmon eggs and everything, and even some with a, like a little blood spot in them and all sorts of different things and the attraction to the thing. But the rainbows that you're catching over there with those, you're talking like 24-inch rainbows, wild fish, that go like stink. By the order they go. They're absolutely unbelievable. So far we've stuck pretty much to the technicalities of the various techniques, and in particular the worm. To put all of this into some sort of context, tell us a bit now about some of the invites you get to demonstrate and teach, plus some of the fish you've caught over the years. Oh, God. <laughs> invites? Well, I would say that I've probably caught more salmon on the worm than I have on the fly. And I've probably fished the worm a lot more than what I've fished the fly. But in bite wise, I went up once up to Tommy Town to teach two guys how to fish the worm. Well, in fact, there should have been three. And I got there on the Sunday and I drove up in the most horrendous rain I think I'd ever experienced going up north. And it was from Leyland right up to Granton on Spey. And when I got to Granton on Spey, it was dry. But everywhere, it was torrential, absolutely unbelievable. And I thought, if it's not going to be any good, it's going to be in flood. Anyway, went down to the river on the Sunday evening and everything, and it was fine. Got up Monday morning, and everything was in absolute chaos. The guy that I was supposed to be teaching had had to go into the kitchen because the chef had decided he wanted to work in the brewery because it was more money. They'd opened a brewery up there. And Dave said to him, well, you're not doing that. Like, you know, I want you to go home and talk to your mum and dad. You've come up here to learn to be a chef. That's where you're going to. So he disappeared down to Derby. So David had to go into the, into the kitchen, and then, of course, I was supposed to be teaching his father as well, and 
neither of them could come. So I ended up going fishing. I just went fishing. And the first morning I had three salmon by one o'clock. And the third one I got, I got it upstream spinning, what they call a flying sea. And it hit me that hard. I was on a bank above the water. I nearly went in. It hit that hard. It nearly pulled me in. And then I got two more in the afternoon. I kept one fish out of the five. And then fished most of the week on my own. But then I did two days with David and his dad. And his dad was somebody that had never fished the worm before. And on the second day caught a fish as did David. So dad's still there. Dad has the post office up in Tommy Town. Now whether he's still fishing or not, I don't know. I've not seen him. But David now lives in America, and uh, he disappeared over there some years ago when all the things went wrong in the village with the hotel. And then I've been on, the, I've got an invite to go on the uh, Tay and went harling, which is something I've never done before. Again in a boat where you're actually going down the river, you've moated up the river, and then you're anchored, and then you're let out on a rope, and they let you go down to the pace of the river on a rope and whatever, and your rods straight out from either side of the boat and you just wait, wait and wait and wait and all of a sudden, wang, and you just pick it up and the fish is hooked. And by the use spirit baits for that, kind of killers and uh, tobies, devon minnows, that type of thing. That was good. That was a, a, a real, real education. But we fly fished as well. Again, where you fly fishing normally, but you're actually on a tether on a rope and you were being let down the river. Very interesting that. Didn't catch, didn't catch at all. But then on uh, Stobol, when you get down the bottom end of the beach, it's like a lagoon. It's such a, a massive expanse of water. One side of it's like a beach at the seaside with this, the shingle bank and whatever. There was a guy at a tent there and he, he lit a fire and obviously he was making a brew or whatever. And he was quite a long way away. And Michael Johnson, the guy that I was with, said to me, you cast well. He said, you really amaze me. I said, well, it's only technique. It's the wrist movement, not nothing else, you know, but you've got to be careful what you know what you're doing. With it. He said, I reckon you can get him, you can make him jump, we can splash him. I said, Well, I reckon I can, and I did. They fired this Toby out and it hit the water, and the bloke jumped and turned around and looked and whatever, and then went, <laughs> whacked his face because I'd, I'd actually splashed him. It was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. But then the following day, Harlan, I got a six pound brownie, which was one hell of a fish, and then. Ooh, where, where else have I been? I've been different places with different people, different types of fishing. And as I said, I learned to fly fish in the dark at night. And that was on invitation with uh, Alan Latham from Exxon. We used to go up in an E-type jag. And if there were three of us went, I had to sit in the back across. So I went up sideways, like, you know. Amazing experience, fishing dead nook and going in there for the first time. Absolutely amazing. And then going somewhere else and hooking the first sea trout and not being told, not having been told what to do. And there's a guy there, and he's only very small, and he's, let it go, let it go, let it go. Said, I'm not letting it go, I've only just got it, let it go, let it go. And ping, of course, it came up. Who taught you how to so and so fish? Proper Scottish he was. Did you not understand what let it go meant? I said, no. I said, and he said, well, you've got to play him. He said, that's why you've got that rate. Let the line go through your finger. He said, then when it stops running, then you wind it back again. So then my mate got out of the water, and he would be six foot four, something like that, Alan. And this bloke's tried to poke him in his chest and it's a job to reach him, you stupid idiot. Why didn't you tell him the correct way to do it? <laughs> so it was quite funny. But that's, yeah, I learned, I learned to fly fish in the dark at night. And then got my first salmon, my first sea trout, on the Conway, on Hafford Pool, in the same night. And I got one before midnight, which was the sea trout, about three and a half pounds, and then got a five pound grills. I got one on teal blue and silver, and the other one on... Oh, what now? That's stupid. I can see it now and I can't remember what it's called. So, like, who's the clever man that got a salmon and a sea trick last night? Which was quite, quite fantastic. An amazing, amazing thing. People you've met and what you've been able to do with people as well. I've been very fortunate. I've had some marvellous experiences. I mean, the Alaskan thing was going over to uh, Philadelphia working and uh, went over training engineers who were all self-employed. And it was an absolute delight to do because the way they were, because they wanted the knowledge. So they were, they were really keen to know. So it, it was an absolute doddle to do. And through that, got the invitation of Scott to go to uh, Anchorage and then being taken out on the Kenai River and then going on the Crescent River, which we, let, we went out on a float plane and landed on the lake. And then as we were on the lake, a bear appeared on the opposite bank of the lake. And then as we were dropped off on the boat, with the guide, the boat went across the river to take the bags for the other guys that he was going back to pick up. And he shouted across, hey guys, there's a bird downstream. 
and probably as near as the bottom end of our garden, so it's not that far away, is it? I couldn't find Anne. She disappeared behind the guy because he had the gun. <laughs> but he just went in the water and got a salmon out and he got us fishing and he di- disappeared. All you hear is click. You know, he's pulled the hammer back on the gun and he disappeared into the uh, into the bush and everything. And uh, he came back, he said, it's gone. He said, there's nothing about now. And when we got back on the plane, we had to wait for the boat to go back down and come back up again. And um, as we were going up the ladder into the plane, a bear walked down the, the beach on the side of the lake. 10 foot, 15 foot away. And the pilot shouting, Yogi, <laughs> Yogi. <laughs> this well, But we got the photographs of it, you know, sort of bit, uh, but yeah, they're just amazing experiences. I have been looking, I've got it. I've been to some nice places. But that this time, that's the, when I got the five in the day, that was, that was just absolutely amazing. And a stretch of water that I never ever thought I'd get to fish. And yet, when I applied, at one time you couldn't get on it, it was impossible. But when I applied, I said, yeah, when do you want to come? So we did end of May, the first time I went, and then we went back again at the end of August, which is something I, I don't regret at all. But then we started going up the next to the last week of August, and uh, we went up this time, and a lovely, lovely place to go. We do all salmon fishing, there's a lot of walking, but the bottom end of the beach, once you've parked your vehicle up and, and you walk, it's not too far to walk. It's so tranquil. There's just nothing there at all. You see the birds and whatever. And then, of course, then there's the, uh, the RAF. The, they come over low flying, and I mean the low flying. You can read the numbers on the bottoms of the plane, you know. My granddaughter was with this time, and uh, the plane came over. Well, it, and, of course, you got all of a fishing rod up. Well, you can only cover one ear up. <laughs> oh, my God, what was that? And they said, well, uh, put your rod down and put your hand on both ears, because there's another one coming. How do you know? I said, because they're always in twos. Whoosh, over it went. But going back to the five day, I actually started at the top of the beach, nearest to the village. And the first pool up there I got a five pounder. Fished it for half an hour after that, nothing. Moved down to the bridge, got one eight pound. Enfish again, so that, that's two enfish I had. Then I went down to the bottom end of the beach where you've got a bit of a walk and whatever. It's a, a lovely spot, really, really nice. Where I'd seen all the fish the day before. And uh, ended up getting a, a, a twelve pounder and then this huge thing came into the pool, it was a massive splash, cast up stream and hooked it, and it whisked straight back into the pool, I got it out, got it in the side eventually, after about half an hour, measured it on the length of my rod, and I could see it was a, a henfish, on my bottom section of my rod, it's actually about 41 inches long, and it was within an inch of the end of the rod, I put my rod down, and I went to pick it up, just to feel the weight of it and everything, I got one hand underneath it, and it flipped, and it had gone, and it snapped the line like a carrot and disappeared into the depths. I just sat there for ten minutes. I, well, I made a brew. Sat there for ten minutes. I was shaking that much. It was on Zoom. So I thought, well, I'll leave this now. So I went down to the dump pool, which is a little bit lower down, and I hadn't fished that at all. And I went in, and uh, third cast, bang, I'm in again. Get it in the side. What is it? End fish. Measured it again on, on the uh, on the rod and whatever, because we have a chart and everything. It was about £15, pounds, so what a day. Best day's fishing I've ever had, I, mean, I must admit. Apart from the Alaska experience, that was something totally different. But the shame about it all was I was on my own, and everyone was a henfish, so everyone had to go back. <laughs> but I'll put it in the book. It's in the book, in the log. Best fishing I've ever had. And all taken on the worm. All on the worm, eh? And in your opinion, a technique that's completely undeserving of whatever bad press might come its way. Yes, it is, in totally, totally, absolutely. It's something that um, it will work when other things don't. And it's always worth trying. And I can't understand people who say, it's not right. It just doesn't make sense to me. If you're out there for the sport and you take a fish, right? You take a fish, you take two fish in a year. That's as much as I'll take. That's, I don't need any more. And it's a sport, isn't it? When all said and done. And it's, it's, it's a hobby. It's relaxation. And it beats work every time, doesn't it? And I've always said that. I don't understand I think basically it's an ignorance of what it's about. And why it should be frowned on, I do not know. Because there'll be a lot more fish caught on worm long before flies were invented. And what better point could there be to wind the interview up on? All that now remains is to say a very big thank you to Bill for helping our understanding of and for promoting a technique which, when practised properly, fully deserves its place in salmon fishing's armoury. Mm-hmm.